Hello? Okay, good. So, uh, when everybody come up and, and bring the elements, we're going to, or take the elements, we're going to have communion. We do this um, often. I think we do we need to do it oftener. Okay, and the reason I say that we need to do this oftener is because when we know what it is that we are to remember, it makes us want to do this all the time. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This, this cup is the New Testament, in my blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now listen to what Paul says next. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he has eaten and drinking unworthily. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What in the world is he talking about? What Jesus told us on the, at the Lord's Supper and what Paul is reciting here is what it is we are to remember. We are not to be sitting here focusing on our sin. Jesus said, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Jesus' focus on your sin was to die for your sin and pay the price for your sin. So what we should be focusing on is our Redeemer, the one who shed his blood to purchase us from the slavery of sin. And if we don't do it that way, if we don't understand what we're remembering, we're at risk of judgment because we're rejecting the redemption of Christ. So I would encourage you to do this all the time. I try to take communion every day because I love to remember that the Lord's body was broken for me so that I would have fullness of life. I love to remember that Jesus' blood was shed for me because he redeemed me from the judgment of God and converted me from an enemy of God to an heir of God. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to remember what Jesus did for us. Help us to never forget. Help us to always remember. And we praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, children's church. Everybody else who feels like a child today.
morning, Bright Star Church. Um, I want to talk to you this morning. Okay, um, we're all looking for truth, folks. I think that's one of the biggest issues that mankind has. We're always looking for truth. What is truth? In this carnal world we're living in, that's lost and dying, we're very confused at times. What is truth? What is truth? Now, uh, most people today, especially in America, really don't know, want the truth. With our religion of humanism, you understand what humanism, that man is focused on mankind rather than on Jesus, all they want is to cons a constant reassurance that what they choose to believe is true. If I choose to believe this, this is true, no matter whether it is or it isn't. But folks, the absence of truth creates fear when you don't really know the truth it creates fear you know I'm going to touch on a topic and kind of add on where Irwin's done an excellent job over the last few Sundays of bringing the gospel to us uh, but I want to take it a step further and look at the gospel in an aspect that some people just totally miss. Somewhere in the past, a tragic divorce has occurred. And I'm going to explain that through this study. And all there's four points I'm going to touch on today. It isn't long, but uh, just to put it in place, uh, next Sunday we'll have Easter Sunday. The Sunday after that, I'm going to speak to you again, and I'm going to catapult us in time from today to 2023 and show you the cause and effect of having the gospel and the rapture not tied together, the cause and effect of what it's having on our world today. We'll take a look at it, how it's affecting us. The net title of this lesson is the consequence of divorcing the rapture from the gospel message. Many theologians feel it was necessary to separate the return of Jesus for his church, his bride, from the gospel message. The result of this ultimately untimely divorce has led to a death of understanding many believers regarding Jesus appearing and the joyful anticipation that comes with this awareness. Many pulpits across America and in the world have avoided teaching about our blessed hope. And that blessed hope is the rapture in churches today. This leaves many believers confused because they believe they will just die and that's it. It ends, you, you die. They never realize to have this beautiful expectation of Jesus coming again to meet us in the air. This message directly contradicts the New Testament passages that we find in 1 Corinthians 15 through 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Do you understand what that just said? There's going to be a generation of us here at the time of the rapture that will never die. Amen? I hope to be part of that. Along with 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, where? In the air, not here on this earth. To meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Now, this passage does not refer to the second coming of Christ. The rapture and the second coming are two separate events. The Apostle Paul believed that there would be many saints, true believers in Christ, at the time of the rapture. Yet today, many preachers refuse to acknowledge this fact. There are numerous New Testament texts that connect Jesus' imminent return for his church directly with the gospel message. Let me share these with you. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing. What's the blessed hope? The rapture. Of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, for himself, not for ourselves, our benefit, for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. Then there's Philippians 3, verse 20 through 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able, even to subdue all things to himself. I hope you can see Jesus' imminent appearing, appearing our blessed hope, and our receipt of immortal, imperishable bodies were essential elements of the gospel preached to the early saints. This raises a question to me, though. Fast forward to 2023. How and why has this changed so drastically in our day? Do you see the error? The first point I want to make with you is the omission of teaching about the rapture. Let me say, the consequences of this change have been tragic. This divorce of the rapture from the gospel negatively impacts our youth, new believers, as well as seasoned saints. Not to forget the lack of impact that it has on non-believers, a non-believer's life, to convict them to bring them to salvation. It leaves them ill prepared to live in a fear-ridden society because teaching provides no prophetic hope when they teach that, into which they can understand the violence and lawlessness and the darkness of these latter days. Is there any question in your heart that we're living in those latter days? No, can't be. God gave us too many signs to watch for. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead and even... Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. When is the wrath coming? Do you know when the wrath is coming? I think the seven years of tribulation, God tells you the wrath of God. But God delivers us from that. All we have to do is deliver ourselves to him. Give your life over to him. The New Thessalonians converts upon hearing this message from Paul, immediately began waiting for his appearing, also known as the rapture. It is evident that Paul preached the return of Jesus for his church, his bride, from the very beginning. This led to the Thessalonians responding with eager anticipation. They thought it'd be tomorrow. 
next week, next month. They thought it was soon. They never dreamed it would be this period of time. These new converts were so fixated on their soon departure that when someone among them died prior to the rapture, they grieved. Totally unnecessarily, but they grieved, thinking they had missed the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. In Romans 8, verse 23, the Apostle Paul addresses the redemption of our bodies. And in verse 24, he says, For in this hope we were saved. Paul regarded the rapture as a key aspect of his preaching because it signified hope. And Irwin says, I always need to speak on hope. Okay, I'm married to hope. <laughs> which is contained in the saving message of the gospel. Romans 8, verse 23 and 24. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Why does one still hope? When he sees. The fact is, Jesus promises eternal life to all who believe in him. Is it the rapture that begins? It is the rapture that begins our experience and gives us our blessed hope. In the rapture, we receive our immortal bodies. I'm waiting on that. This one here is getting pretty wore out. Sweet Cheryl, I know, is getting close. And Sue, I feel so much for those ladies and all. I've been on the phone with them multiple times and love them to death. We as a church family need to lift them up and love on them. First Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And I realize some of these scriptures are repeated twice. They're going to think that I don't know it, but it's worth speaking twice. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. What is death? What is the sting of death when we have this promise? In the rapture, we are taken to a place where Jesus has prepared for us. John 14, verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I'd have told you. I go to a place to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Church, the rapture is the joyous future tense of the gospel message and something people desperately need to hear today. Second point, diversion of the believer's focus. If I can divert your attention to worldly things or earthly aspirations, you see, I'm taking it off of Jesus, right? Isn't that what Satan wants to do? Every chance he gets, he wants to take your attention from this to that. Okay? He's a master of lies. The father of all of them. A second result of the divorce of the rapture is that it takes the eyes of believers away from the ultimate hope in a season of time they need it the most. The last days. We're here now. 
Satan knows the prophecies, guys. He knows them. And because he knows them, he knows his time's getting short. Right? And if it's getting short, what's he doing? He's getting real active, isn't he? He's got his demons out there. He's got everything he can do in this society we live in. He wants our young people. He's after them. They've got more to offer than we old folks have that are set in our ways. Consequently, their eyes remain focused on earthly aspiration. Like I said, humanism is the religion of not only America, but our world today. More often than not, pastors neglect talking about what happens in the moment Jesus returns for his church. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when it is, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Praise God. Philippians 3, verses 20 through 21. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Doesn't talk anything about standing here on this earth, does it? It's all about God and that time. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Even pastors that believe these things abstain from ever mentioning the believer's hope of immortal bodies, fearing that if they even mention the rapture, it might hurt attendance. Well, let me tell you about attendance, guys. God always deals with the remnant. The remnant. Noah's day, what did he deal with? The remnant. Sodom and Gomorrah, what did he deal with? The remnant. In the latter days, what's he going to deal with with the Jewish people? The remnant. You understand? That should tell you something, shouldn't it? There is no greater time than now that the saints need to hear about the blessed hope, the rapture. I talk to people and I mention to them, what do you know about the rapture? And it's like a deer in the headlights, folks. Oh, well, you know, it's in Revelation. We, you know, and they give you everything in the world but they know absolutely nothing of truth. Why? Because this, the pulpit, has neglected the teaching that it should be putting forth to bring the saints to fruition. I live my life with full knowledge that God is in his sovereignty, is in full control of all things. I have no doubt of that. I also live expectantly knowing that King Jesus is coming for me just as he promised. My question to you, is he coming for you also? Do you know it? Not in your heart. You see, God knows your heart, but he's not after your heart, folks. That heart's dark. It's wicked. Who can understand it? He's after your soul. You understand? 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11. 
But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape from the rock. <laughs> Had to do that. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. Why is that? Why is that? Darkness hides their sin, doesn't it? Yeah. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not point us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Who dies for us, that whether we wake up or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. Biblical prophecy puts current events into perspective. We're going to get into that more so in the next part of this message. Biblical prophecy, God's foretelling, not foretelling, but forthtelling of what is going to happen in mankind's series of events. He's already told us what to expect. You believe that? I do. I've been preaching on it for quite a few years now. And offers joyous hope for both those in Christ and outside of saving faith. Any sermon that emphasizes this life at the expense of the future tense, the rapture of the gospel forms a great disservice to the lives of many in the body of Christ. You've heard this statement, live your best life now. I guess if you're going to hell, you're living your best life now. That's what I got to say about that one. Point number three. Most of you have heard the term wokeism. That's a new word to me. And I, I had to go look the dictionary up and find the definition of it even. It's popular in our society today that we hear wokeism. So let me share that definition for you folks that may not know what it really says. Wokeism is weaponized personal grievances masquerading as a genuine social concern. It is defined by its fraudulent nature as being distinct from legitimate social grievances. Wokeism only knows outrage. It knows not empathy for its victims. In the church today, wokeism is eroding the purity of the gospel. Would you agree with that? Seeing the purity of the gospel being eroded from my life, I'll be 74 for too long. I've seen massive changes that I would have never have dreamed back when I was in my 18-year-old state of life. I wouldn't believe that this world would get to where it is today. It's only when you look back that you see all this. If you're running forward and living life as every day, living tomorrow just like you did the day before and not making any kind of concern about it, that's all you'll ever see. Satan's got you right where he wants it. If you are a premillennialist, as I am, you believe in the rapture, you believe in a literal seven-year tribulation, and Jesus' thousand-year reign, all which is a defense of the purity of the gospel and a safeguard against wokeism in the church. 
You see, once a pastor's church or denomination relegates a prophetic passage to allegory, and for those of you that don't know what allegory means, it is a symbolic fictional narrative that conveys a meaning not explicitly set forth in the narrative. For example, fables and parables may apply. This opens the door that so others can apply this same allegory, methodology, to other Bible passages, allowing for false teaching, Satan at work, false gospel. In the New Testament, God warns us to watch out for that, of false teaching, false gospel, false prophets. You know, it, just, it just over and over and over again puts that warning in front of us. Now, this can be a very slow process of over a period of time. An example of this is known as replacement theology. And if you've been around me, you've heard me say something about replacement theology before, which advocates that God's promise to Israel is a symbolism fulfilled now by the church. That's one of Satan's master lies, guys. But it is affecting 65% of Christendom today in our universities, our theological seminaries, our churches, and you add it all up, they calculate it's around 65% of them are giving way to replacement theology. The altering of intent of prophetic passages in the Bible opens the door to compromise inside a woke culture. The rule I like to follow is if the plain sense doesn't make sense, seek no other sense or you'll wind up with nonsense. It may take years for these theology, theologies to materialize, but eventually it will happen. Remember our lives are just a vapor. The time we're here on the face of this earth is just... Satan's eternal right now. God's eternal. These things take time and time and time. That's why you stand close to God's word, because it's eternal. It gives you that insight. Even spiritual passages relating to the sanctity of marriage can fall by the wayside. My question to you, are we seeing that today? Are we seeing marriages under attack? Are we seeing it, households and homes being destroyed? Even if people can get married nowadays. Whether for the sake of those coming to faith in Jesus or for those already in faith, we must reunite the message of the gospel with the blessed hope, the rapture. The divorce of the two has done much damage to the purity of the gospel historically in the church over that period of time. Point number four. There is a silence regarding the joys, blessed hope. Now the gospel message plainly put, and Irwin covered all this pretty well, and so I'm just going to summarize. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the resurrection Sunday we're looking at next Sunday celebration we call it Easter he ascended to heaven he is coming again to give us imperishable immortal bodies he is going to take us to an eternal place he has prepared for us Jesus resurrection folks means that we too We'll live forever with bodies that will never grow old, get sick, or die. I can't even hardly fathom that. The tragedy is the church is far too silent on this important matter. I hope today that you realize my heart is to throw open the door of silence. Titus 2, 11 through 14, places our blessed hope to the gospel message. 
For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, not for our benefit. He's purifying us for his self, his own special people, zealous for good works. The aversion to mention the rapture has led to silence in many churches regarding the true meaning of our blessed hope. The divorce of our blessed hope from the gospel has tragically led to a focus on temporal outcomes within the church today. We have lost the excitement and anticipation of Jesus' return for us. And there is a loss of preserving the purity of the gospel that sadly impacts not only our own future, but generations, your children and grandchildren, and the generations you don't even know yet. I've got great grandchildren coming into this world now who apply the same methodology used to deny premillennialism to other clear passages of God's word. That's the message today, folks. What I want to do is take the crux of what I'm saying to you today. Keep it in mind. We'll have our Easter Sunday. Very special service we're going to have. After that... I'll bring the message back. And like I said, I'm going to catapult it to 2023 and try to give you a picture of the cause and effect of this divorce of the gospel and the cause and effect it's having on our world and our society today. And the reason. The returning of God, when he's coming back, is not something I'm really focused on. I'm really focused on why he's coming back. Because he's coming back to deal with the last vestiges of sin. The wind, that's his business. But you get people trying to predict winds and all this, that's garbage. Stay focused on why Jesus is coming back. If there is anyone in here that has not given their life to Christ, I'll be down front here in a few moments if this choir wants to come back up, please come. Please tell your family and members of the Easter Sunday celebrations. And keep in mind those have been mentioned in prayer. God, we're thankful, Lord, to your house, to have you as our loving God, to give us understanding and make sense of this drastic world we're living in, Lord. Father, go with us as we walk out. Make us your disciples to make a difference, Father God. We ask in the name of Jesus, truly our blessed hope. Amen.